we will. We'll turn up the front lights. Are you ready to roll? Okay, so uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Mukund Rangamani from the University of Durham uh, give us a talk. He is uh, a string theorist who worked on many aspects of string theory and lately uh, probably uh, mostly the ads CFT correspondence and aspects of entanglement. Uh, he's going to tell us about one of the a subject where he was uh, one of the it's fine, one of the pioneers the relationship between gravity and hydrodynamics. Look at our okay. Thank you, Marcus, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming to the talk and also for having me over. So um, I was debating what to talk about, and um, in the process decided that uh, I should actually talk about this particular topic, which is near and dear to my heart. But um, for, for a very particular purpose, I'm trying to emphasize a certain point that sometimes, I mean, we're, we're all used to this, and we all know this, but it, it's, 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 it's useful to be reminded uh, over and over again, that looking at a problem which had existed perhaps for a long time from, um, uh, from a very different perspective uh, leads to surprising new insights and uh, connections that you don't already um, envisage, and uh, that, that's going to be sort of overarching theme of this talk. Um, it will, strangely enough, for most part, involve no string theory. So I will talk about black holes, classical relativity, and hydrodynamics as a classical theory. So let me begin, uh, without further ado, asking the following question. So here are three physical systems which we observe in nature. One is a sort of complicated soup of um, strongly interacting particles called, uh, called gluon plasma formed in heavy ion collisions. The other is a much much more um, tabletop-ish uh, 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 state of matter. It's a Bose-Einstein condensate formed, formed in Fermi systems uh, by tuning some uh, couplings. And the third is black hole that we sort of look up in the sky and uh, see. So what's the the question is this, what is the connection between these three a priori different sounding and so, sort of unrelated uh, states of uh, matter or um, structures? So let me tell you what these structures are first. So the quark gluon plasma is typically formed um, in heavy ion collisions. You, you collide two heavy nuclei, the, the, the collision process is being demonstrated in some animation that I picked up on the web. And uh, what's happening here is that the collision happens. There's some intermediate stage, which is now being described by some uh, by this sort of block that uh, uh, expanded and cooled down. And once the block cools down, then uh, what you what you what, what comes out at you and what, what people actually see in experiments are these head of these white whitish um, billiard balls. Okay. But but the, but the key but the key point is there's an intermediate state of matter which was this yellow block that was expanding, which is quite exotic. <clears throat> it's certainly material that has been observed in the real world. It's been seen in Brookhaven in the uh, heavy ion collider and at LAC. So, so that's one state of matter. The second, uh, sorry, no animation, um, uh, is uh, uh, in the physics of cold atoms. So you make a cold atom trap. You take some uh, a couple of thousand cold atoms. You put them in a harmonic trap. And uh, this process shows you a snapshot of you, you take these atoms in this trap, so it's, in a, it's like a harmonic potential, and then you let go. Okay? So the atoms sort of relax, they're sort of, there's no potential holding them anymore, so they sort of relax in some fashion. The first, the first line here shows the, the time series images of how this velocity distribution of these atoms evolves as a function of time when you initially put it in a non rotating trap. The second configuration, the color? the color coding is density profile, uh, you know, velocity distribution. The second profile is for the same thing, <coughs> but uh, when you sort of spin up the, put, the trap a little bit. So yeah, I think uh, frequency here, omega is about 0.4, and this is for much higher spin. And the process here is to ask the following question. I set, I set this up, and I want to sort of imagine this uh, configuration. As Sorry, are the axes velocity or position? They, they, they are uh, positions. The, this axis is position. This is just something on each, on each, on, on each plot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Position. 
I want to get the velocity information. Uh, with, with position. Also velocity by time of flight, basically. Yeah, velocity by time position. of flight. I see. see. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rajiv. So you ask um, how the system evolves, and you try to model this evolution uh, as we will see later. But the connection will be hydrodynamics. You ask how it evolves hydrodynamically, and the three three different panels, the three rows of this matrix, are to uh, look at try to look at how the uh, what the friction in the system is. Okay. So eventually, be interested in a particular measure of friction, which you are discussing. So okay, the, but but these we sort of understand. These are many-bodied systems. They can be described in some continuum language in terms of hydrodynamics. The third system was black holes. I again pitched this shamelessly from this paper from last week. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, black holes, uh, you sort of here I have I pitched this par partly to illustrate that this black holes are not sort of isolated objects in our universe. There's stuff around them, and stuff falls into them, and the black holes respond to the stuff that falls into them. So you want to ask, how does the black hole respond? And, and the surprising answer is that for most practical purposes, black holes respond with some response of black holes is very, very well modeled by hydrodynamics. So that's going to be the thesis of what we'll discuss. So the connection, the, <clears throat> the common theme between these three uh, states of matter oops, uh, is the fact that the, the these three uh, systems are very well described by hydrodynamics, and not by any old hydrodynamics, but that examples that we seem to know of um, states of matter with relatively low friction. They are what are best characterized as the most ideal states of fluids that we know of in the real world. And to illustrate, and, and this conjecture in the black hole context uh, and uh, in the context of heavy ions was first made by these people uh, over 10 years ago. And I've just uh, taken a picture from their, <clears throat> from their paper where you, you see this value of the viscosity, which I will review for you in a moment, uh, and uh, compare that against the value for typical uh, materials, helium, nitrogen, and water. And for now, let me caution you that this is a dimensionless viscosity. It's, it's a dynamic viscosity of this fluid in units of its entropy. And I'll tell you why that is the case in a while. So nothing else we know of, in fact, they didn't they, they, uh, comes even remotely close. Everything is at least one order of magnitude higher in this block. So I'll tell you what the value is and what the units are and what there is. But I want to see, use this as a stage uh, setting uh, to set my sort of self to ask, what is it about these black holes? What is it about the system that, that's so nice about hydrodynamics? <coughs> And if you think about it for a moment, you realize that, well, this sounds wrong because hydrodynamics is not, I mean, it, it, it's a theory that um, um, goes back <coughs> uh, to almost 150 or more years, to, to now, the impressive works of Navier and, Navier and Stokes and so on. And, but it's, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a continuum mechanic system which we don't think of <coughs> for, um, macroscopic bodies like black holes. We think of it in the context when we have some statistical description for many small constituents, like gas in this room. We can sort of think of it as a in some kinetic theory language in a hydrodynamic sense and try, try to talk about viscosities and so on for air in this room. But we don't think of black holes as being sort of uh, uh, some intrinsic <coughs> So if you just look at the axioms that go to this, to this building these theories, uh, they're, 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 they're very different. And the only sort of common ground seems to be that um, there's a sort of statistical underpinning to black holes, okay? so which, which, I will, which I will expand on in a second. So, so it sounds funny, but it doesn't sound so funny when I show you this. Um, so about three or four decades ago, people started examining properties of black holes. Mm -hmm. And they, they realized that there's a very close correspondence between properties of black holes and standard thermodynamics law that we would teach in thermodynamics 101. So you know, in, in thermodynamics we would we would teach the zeroth law. We would say temperature is constant in thermal equilibrium. We would sort of talk about energy conservation that there's some kind of first law principle. And then there's famous Boltzmann's theorem, which says that uh, the entropy in any physical process is non-decreasing. 
and uh, the work of people like Carter, Bekenstein, and Hawking came up with sort of three interesting statements. Complete at this point, which are just analogies. It says that there's an object like temperature, which is the surface gravity. You can think of that as the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the black hole, um, which is constant everywhere on the surface of the black hole. There is energy conservation because it's a theory with uh, diffeomorphism symmetry, which, which looks like the statement of first law. Except that when I change, when I look at the statement of first law, change in energy is given by temperature times change in entropy by the Clausius relation. Um, and uh, so, something similar happens here that the change in mass is related to the surface gravity times the change in area of the black hole. So I'm imagining a process where I throw in a little bit of matter into the black hole, ask how much the energy changes. The energy changes by some small amount dm, but at the same time, the area of the black hole also changes. And then there's a very famous theorem by Hawking, which says that the area of this black hole, the event horizon, is also non-decreasing in analogy with the second law of thermodynamics. So <clears throat> at this point, this, this, this set of analogies um, uh, was what uh, led Bekenstein to think of assigning some kind of notion of entropy associated with the area to black holes. But it was really Hawking's seminal work of, trying to, of say, talking about black hole evaporation, like the black holes radiate like black bodies, that really made this identification between entropy and area precise. And we know this is true. <clears throat> but, and people way back then, uh, in notably Thibaut de uh, PhD thesis, and later um, <clears throat> Price and Thorn, um, came up with a, an extension of this analogy, which was closer to hydrodynamics, closer to the spirit of what I'm talking about. And their point was this. The fact that somehow black holes are statistical, they, have some, they carry some intrinsic entropy, but this entropy is related to the kind of the, the sort of surface of the black hole suggests that there is a notion of uh, dynamics on the surface. The black hole surface is like some kind of impermeable, some kind of membrane, and the oscillations of this membrane are what sort of should be thought of as the effective theory of the black hole. And and so they they came up with this word, uh, try some thought, uh, called the membrane paradigm, where they sort of came up uh, sort of thought about thinking of. Forget the interior of the black hole, which is some exotic um, um, region of space-time that we don't get to see unless we want to jump right in and not come back. Uh, so we we'll think of this membrane as, as some kind of mechanical membrane, it may be, and maybe it even has electrical properties, so it's some electromechanical membrane. And the response of the black hole to stuff falling in can be understood as stuff falling through some kind of membrane. So you sort of look at couplings of this membrane to external stuff. And so, 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 so Damur came upon this analogy with, between uh, um, uh, 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 Einstein's equations and some kind of hydrodynamic equations <coughs> uh, by just looking at the properties of the black hole uh, uh, horizon. But in the words of Price and Thorne, they weren't sort of so, 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 so much interested in the fundamental properties of the membrane, but rather as the power of an analogy of how one can use it to simplify the dynamics of black holes into something much more tangible and use it to model astrophysical <coughs> processes. And indeed, this, this, this paradigm um, is certainly used in, in things like in astrophysical modeling of um, ec um, accretion disks and sort of jets from uh, accretion disks in the magnetosphere of black holes. But I should emphasize that this was at, should always be thought of as an analogy. If you sort of think of this problem very seriously, you, you, what you find is that you find that this black hole, uh, this black hole membrane is a sort of slightly funny object. It's not, it's, you know, in a theory of gravity, you know, it's, which is relativistic, the fluid is non-relativistic, it's compressible, but then it has one particular viscosity, which is like a friction coefficient, which is negative, so it looks like it's sort of violating some basic principle. But also it's not sort of derived in some fundamental way, it's sort of looking at, it's derived in some analogy. So this was a state of affairs, and, but, but nevertheless, like all analogies, it, ha it has great power. Okay. So, so this brings me to asking the following question. What is hydrodynamics, and what should one do if one wants to sort of think about hydrodynamics from first principles? So I'm going to sort of use this as a, uh, as a jumping ground. I'm going to sort of stop, stop this discussion about the connection between these three sets of states of matter I've talked about, and 
take a slight detour into telling you what hydrodynamics is as a first principles theory, and what the basic axioms of hydrodynamics are, as, as I have come to appreciate in the last few years. I mean, people have known this, but I think we sort of, this is, this is I, I, will, I will try to convince you by the end of this talk, this is no longer a working hypothesis, these are not axioms, we can derive this. So, and uh, to, to, to be very clear, what I want to talk about is, is relativistic fluid dynamics. I mean, I think everything I say can be done for usual non-relativistic fluid dynamics, now the Stokes equation, but, but for reasons of, of my own interest, I, I, I'm going to talk about the relativistic case, which is simpler and, um, and has direct bearing on what I'm going to say. So the first statement I'll make is that if you want to ask about what is relativistic fluid dynamics, you should think of this as the universal low energy physics of any quantum system, any relativistic quantum system, which is in local but not global thermal equilibrium. Okay, global thermal equilibrium is simply one where everything is, is, is very quiescent, it's a stationary state, but once you sort of deviate from that global thermality, then, you, then hydrodynamics comes into play, provided you're asking questions where the deviations from global thermality are macroscopic. Okay, that, that sort of what happens is, this description as an effective field theory is only valid on length scales that are much, much bigger than sort of characteristic scales of the local equilibrium. So in, in, in some kind of um, analogy with the gas in this room, so you have atoms of, 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 of our gas molecules that are colliding with each other, and there's a sort of typical length scale between their collisions, some kind of mean free path, and, and some mean free time between the collisions. And if you ask questions on length scales and time scales that are much bigger than those mean free paths and mean free times, you should be able to apply the dynamics. And I like to know, I, I, I think this analogy is actually quite quite nice. You can think of hydrodynamics in the same language as we teach, perhaps in high school or undergraduate, the domain theory of magnetism. Really, what happens in a, in a, in a fluid is they have local domains which are locally equilibrated, and they have local um, notions of temperature, local notions of energy, and so on, which follow from that local equilibrium. But then these local domains are not impermeable. They sort of exchange energy and other conserved charges across domains. And there's some kind of flux vector that tells you which direction things are, uh, things are being exchanged. So there's a sort of ba the basic degrees of freedom. I'm sorry, should we think of reasonably sharp boundaries between? No, no, no. So th this is just, th so sorry. I mean, you know, th that, that was just a caricature for, for saying that there is some local structure that but locally, you know, I, I look here, there's some open neighborhood around me where, where I have some local temperature, some neighboring open set where there's slightly different temperature and there's some energy exchange between us. So formally, I would just say it's the low energy physics of near equilibrium fluctuations. Uh, when you take some thermal density matrix, some Gibson density matrix, and then allow the density matrix to have small deviations. And what you do, as in any effective field theory, is you, you don't ask detailed questions. You ask questions about a few macroscopic observables. And the macroscopic observables you ask in hydrodynamics are very simple. They're just the total energies and charges, and uh, uh, one other object, which I will come to later, uh, which, which is a bit more mysterious, but certainly energies and charges we, we understand, and we can, we can talk about it. <coughs> so in the relativistic language, there's some energy momentum current and the charge <coughs> current, that, 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 that are sort of the basic building blocks of the hydrodynamic effective field theories. And these currents should be viewed as functionals of some basic hydrodynamic fields. So what are these basic hydrodynamic fields? Well, locally we have thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium is characterized by some local temperature. If you have charges, you have some local chemical potential. So these are the various basic variables. But in addition, you also have the fact that you can sort of allow yourself to move from local domain to local domain, so there's some flux vector that tells you what, 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 the, what the exchange of uh, energy and, and charges is. So there's a, in, in relativistic language, there's a velocity field, uh, if you're in four dimensions, there's a four velocity, which basically sets the direction of time, locally. It sets the, it's, it sets the local inertial frame for the local, for the density matrix at that point. So there's a normalized four velocity, and then, to ask interesting questions, you also need sort of to be able to sort of disturb the fluid. And the disturbance of the fluid, of course, is done by coupling it to background sources. In a, in a relativistic field theory, you're free to add background sources. And the sources that naturally talk to energy or to charge are just ge geometric and 
and background electric fields. So electromagnetic fields. So I have I, I will use these objects, a background matrix and a background uh, gauge field to sort of allow allow me to probe this local equilibrium geometry. Is AMU sourced by JMU? Uh, no, so, so a, 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 AMU will couple the JMU, so th th these are not dynamical objects. Okay. AMU doesn't have a okay. uh, kinetic term, should I? Yeah. Uh, and, and this JMU, by the way, will be a rigid background. You're free to pick whatever background you want. But in order for the hydrodynamic theory to be valid, you also want these background matrix and gauge fields, which are classical sources, to also vary very slowly. They shouldn't vary on very rapidly, because if, if things are varying very rapidly, you're outside the regime of this effective field theory. Actually, I'm going to repackage this. This is something that we learned to do um, rather recently. I'm going to repackage these um, dynamical degrees of freedom, which is the velocity and the chemical potential into, into deep slightly different objects, just instead of a velocity, which is normalized, and take an unnormalized velocity by dividing everything by temperature. And it's nice to call that the thermal vector. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> the, the, the chemical potential in, in quantum field theory tells you how, as you take things around in, in the Euclidean time circle, how, how, how you sort of pick up phases. So, so I, I call it a common phase. But, but that's just technicality for now. It's just same data, but it's a nicer thing for it. So here are my fields, the same fields I wrote, wrote before, but now packaged into this beta, lambda, beta business. And the task, uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to be a hydrodynamicist, would be to write down the energy momentum and charge currents in terms of these fields. And consistent as you would ever, uh, always do in, 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 in the language of effective field. Okay. So what is the dynamics of hydrodynamics? The dynamics is actually very boring. It's very simple. It's just conservation. Okay. So, the, the, so, so these are, you have complicated sort of, you have some macroscopic fields that have emerged from, from, from statistical mechanics, but, but all you care about is that this energy momentum and charges are conserved up to either work terms, you know, if you, if you have external sources, if I have an external electromagnetic field, there are forces acting on my system, so my energy is not quite conserved. I have Lorentz, uh, in this case, Lorentz force acting on the system, and there's a corresponding Joule heating term. Or, if you're in a quantum field theory which, where the symmetries associated with this current are not quite are classical symmetries but don't persist to ex don't extend to the quantum theory, then you have anomalies. So the anomalies could also show up here. All, all I'm going to tell you is that these anomalies are very important. Uh, they have really been picked up following everything I'm going to say into how they appear in hydrodynamics. Nobody, as far as I know, has very seriously thought about what anomalies do in thermal physics till, till this, this discussion that I'm going to, I'm going to explain to you. But for our purposes, these are very simple functionals that you can determine uh, from some first principles. But, but let me just say, let me leave it at that. So we have to find these fields consistent. With, we have to find, construct this energy momentum and charge currents in terms of those fields I introduced before. But they have to be consistent with these dynamics. And you know, it's an effective field theory. Most, most of us who do quantum field theory learn how to do effective field theory reasonably well after taking uh, one graduate course. So it doesn't sound like a very hard problem. But there's one catch. And the one catch is that this is not any old effective field theory. It's an effective field theory with one, with one non-trivial constraint. And that non-trivial constraint can be blamed on Boltzmann. It's just a statement that uh, you know, this, this, th this theory of hydrodynamics is consistent with Boltzmann's HCR. It has to be consistent. There has to be some functional of these fields, which you can call some kind of entropy functional. And since I'm relativistic, entropy everything gets become becomes a current, so there's an entropy current functional. And this entropy <coughs> current functional is required such, to be such that under any physical process, any any physical flow of this fluid, entropy doesn't decrease. So mathematically, all it require all, all I require is some kind of vector field, vector field which is a functional of these hydrodynamic fields. Whose divergence is non-negative Question? So, I guess you're going to get to this, but when I think of entropy, I think of entanglement and all kinds of non-local stuff. And you're doing yeah. something <coughs> local here. I'm and doing very local, something very local. local. So, hopefully, by the end of the talk, we'll say something about that. I, 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 
Okay, well, I, 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 this is the moment. Just tell me why you're not going to worry about it. Or good. So, you so I, I think th this entropy is a statistical entropy. So it's, it's, it's a coarse grained entropy. Uh, it's not the kind of fine grained entropy that you think of in entanglement sense. Although, if you do measure fine grained entanglement in this context, which we can talk about in, at length later, you will see this contribution too. Okay. Um, I, I will tell you that this, 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 so something I won't go into very much detail, but so this, so at this point, these are just axioms. This is how pe people, you know, if, if you read Landau Lipschitz's textbook on hydrodynamics, this is what they will tell you these are the rules. Right. I will tell you. sort of macroscopic exactly. sense that you think about it. Right. Yeah. I will, however, tell you that there's a picture that has emerged from our construction <laughs> which suggests a microscopic origin of this, of this, of this object. But like everything else, it comes with caveats, and but it also suggests a, a very nice understanding of non-equilibrium physics. But okay. but wait, wait, wait till the end. I, I might not tell you everything, but then we can talk about it. <clears throat> Good. So so this makes the, the task of actually understanding hydrodynamics reasonably complicated. Okay. So I say if you, if you actually try to do this in reality, it looks very complex. Um, although. There are very many brave people, and uh, people have understood how to do this properly, all orders in hydrodynamics. That's something I'll, I'll mention later. And there are many puzzles of how, how, how this works. Um, and so, <clears throat> with that, let me sort of ask how this works in practice for now. Okay, so just give, let me just give you an example and, and see what, 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 what this works. So uh, let me switch out the charge, it's just a distraction. So let, let's have our neutral fluid, which just has energy and momentum. So any momentum tends up a neutral fluid has some expression like this, because locally what you do is you, you go, you, you stand here, you pick your local inertial frame, you measure local temperature, and you measure the local energy density. That's, that's this term. And then you measure the local pressures that sort of take you in the direction of the opposite. That's why the, the object that multiplies the pressure is the sort of part orthogonal to the time, it's, it's a spatial part. Um, and then you ask yourself, what happens at higher orders? So this is the sort of ideal fluid. This is what you would write down as an ideal fluid, it just has energy density and pressure. But a non-ideal fluid has dissipative terms, and the dissipative terms here are written in a certain, in a slightly, um, in a, what, what, what should na naturally be called gauge fixed form. But what I've done is, since the variables are the temperature and velocity. I should write down gradient terms involving temperature and velocity, with a lot, which tell me how, when I, when I change the local temperature and local velocity, how, 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 how they affect the energy momentum tensor. So the energy momentum tensor has one derivative terms uh, which involve the gradient of velocity. And since it's a symmetric tensor, it can only involve either the symmetrized piece of the derivative or the, the, the trace piece of the derivative. So that, that's what these two, these two pieces are. Sigma mu nu is a, is a symmetric traceless part of the derivative, and uh, theta is a trace part of the derivative uh, after projection. And then the anti-symmetric part of the derivative, which we'll need later, is called the uh, vorticity. And the part of the derivative that's aligned with the velocity is called acceleration. So that, that's a very simple. <coughs> this, so it's a, it's a two tensor. A two tensor has this. Any two tensor has this natural decomposition. I've just given names to the, the, the <coughs> components. <laughs> And then you now ask, what does the existence of the second law, uh, of, of an entropy current satisfying the second law mean? What it means is, uh, you can, in this case, you can convince yourself that the entropy current actually is just like an ideal fluid entropy times the velocity plus correction, which are also second order and higher. And what it means is that the viscosities are positive. The system is, has friction, it doesn't have anti friction. That the system, if you disturb this fluid, it will relax back. It won't. Keep, the disturbance won't keep going. So, and at this point, I, I have to make my first disclaimer. I told you that these, these fluids of the quark gluon, plasma, and cold atoms were nearly ideal. Okay. So you, and what I meant, what I meant to say was that their shear viscosities are of a certain form. Actually, if you numerically, what, what, what the, the, the ballpark number in units of h bar and Boltzmann constant is h bar over 4 pi Boltzmann constant times the entropy density. And if you ca calculate this for these, these, these uh, systems, it's actually quite large. It's 10 to the 14 um, in units of what are called centipodes. 
uh, after Pursuit. And uh, uh, just to give you an image, 10 to the 14 is very, very large. Water has a viscosity of it. One in these units, peanut butter, which you don't think of as fluid, has a viscosity mm -hmm. of 10 to the 5. So, now, what do I mean by nearly ideal? Okay. Yeah, to, 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 to me, nearly ideal, I have to, I have to non-dimensionalize this object. Eta has dimensions. Okay. So it doesn't make sense to talk about dimensionful objects as being large or small. And the right measure is the rate of entropy production. So if you look at the rate of entropy production, the dimension, the non, the non-dimensionalized rate of entropy production, the, the rate of entropy production per unit entropy, is eta over s sigma squared and zeta over s theta squared. Okay. So if if I have any flow with with shear and expansion, this is the amount the, the amount of entropy produced per, per per given configuration, and it's these ratios that are small. And that's what the plot showed. The plot didn't show eta, it showed eta over s, and that value was much below what you saw for the physical. System. So where are those quantities for the other thing <coughs> on your list? Yeah. Um, good question. So for water, I, is, is what I showed is about 50. I, I actually don't know for peanut butter. I don't have to compute the entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. So it would be... <coughs> Those, are, those would be more. Those would be much more. Yeah. So yeah. This, this number uh, for for this for gluon plasma in, in absolute units is in units where h bar and k b r one is like 0.08. Oh, so water was at 10 or something. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So so that was my detour on fluid dynamics. Now now let me yet again switch case. Yes. How is that related to a Reynolds number? Reynolds number. Where I know Reynolds numbers. Yes. So Reynolds number is usually this dynamic viscosity eta divided by sort of the expectation value of local velocity. And that's a, that's related to entropy production. Right? That's related to entropy production too. So so you so if you actually convert the, this eta over s that I'm talking about to Reynolds number, mm -hmm. this will be fluid with very large Reynolds number. Yeah, I, that, that's sort of what you implied. That's what I'm. Yeah. That it's but, it's. I was wondering, is it the Reynolds number? It's not quite the Reynolds number, but it's, but it's, proportional, to it's proportional to the Reynolds number. Yeah. Literally, literally. Yeah. So small, small eta over s uh, is, uh, is like large Reynolds number. Um, so, but, 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 but just, just to, to give, give you one piece of intuition, the Reynolds number is useful in the non-relativistic incompressible case. Uh, this, this will be not quite not incompressible. This, this, this fluids are compressible and they're relativistic. Okay. So, so, so you, can make, you, can, you can look at flows of these fluids where you don't excite a compressible mode, um, and, and then you can, you, you can sort of talk about a non-relativistic limit and so on and so forth, but, and then they should, be, they should sort of behave like uh, uh, compressible, uh, in, incompressible fluid with uh, large Reynolds numbers. <coughs> So now, switching gears yet again, sorry. Um, I, I want to now sort of ask, can I, can I derive these postures? So can, can, I, can I derive for you this structure from something completely different, from, from first principles in quantum, quantum field theory? That's what I would ideally like to do. But uh, if, you know, if, if you sort of look at your favorite textbook on quantum many body theory, uh, statistical uh, physics, what, what is usually done is you, you start with the basic uh, distribution, uh, um, density matrix that characterizes this local equilibrium, and then you sort of distill it down to some kind of kinetic theory. You write down some effective Boltzmann equation, and you study the Boltzmann equation. I don't want to do that, I want to just derive this energy momentum tense, this, con this constitutive relation of the fluid, just directly. And um, so I'm going to take the following indirect route. I'm going to use the fact that I have a theory uh, coming out of uh, investigations in string theory which is the only place I'm going to use this, which says that there's a correspondence between some, a class of strongly coupled quantum field theories and a class of gravitational theories. For, for the moment, and, and I'm going to just look at the strongly coupled uh, quantum field theories, which, which are of this form, and ask, if I try to hydrodynamics in those theories, what am I doing in a gravitational context? What do I get? 
do I get hydrodynamic or do I get something much more complicated? Okay. And, <coughs> and from this analogy, uh, this, from this, this perspective, is what I will, I will derive this fluid gravity correspondence. But just to give you a feeling, the, the, the statement of this ADS-CFT correspondence is simply this. So I have, I have a string theory. This string theory lives in a universe which is negatively curved. This is this picture here. So this is, this is like a soup camp. And cross section of the soup camp are negatively curved spatial geometries. And time runs up. And whatever happens to the string theory, which involves various things involving black holes, gravity, etc., etc., is equivalently described by something that happens to a theory without strings, without gravity, that lives on the boundary. That's what this is supposed to indicate. Okay, so, so all I have is some tra traditional garden variety quantum field theory, maybe with supersymmetry, but okay. some people garden variety, and, and uh, everything that happens in that in that in, on that side. In including dynamics of black holes is completely captured by this. And that's all I need because and there are, there's a regime of parameters where the, the string theory can be distilled down to classical gravity. And in that regime of parameters, what happens to this quantum field theory is that it looks like it's it has many, many degrees of freedom and is strongly covered. Okay. We won't need the specifics of what happens. So let's 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 just take that limit and ask. I have boiled down the string theory to dynamics of gravity in the space time. What can I learn here? So I have some strongly coupled quantum field theory. I'm going to try to make that fluid approximation to the strongly coupled field theory. What do I see in the gravity? Cell? But I, of course, don't want to study the quantum field theory in its vacuum. I want to study it in a thermal bath. So I want to sort of heat up this system. And uh, it's very easy to do that here. You just stick in a black hole in this interior of the space time. So the black hole lives here. The fluid lives here. And I'll just tell you the answer. The answer, which, which, which uh, we came up with, I came up with various collaborators uh, seven, eight years ago, was just this. The equations that describe gravity, just familiar Einstein's equations with one extra complication that they have a cosmological constant because <coughs> the universe is negatively curved, are identical. There's a subset of these equations which is nothing more and nothing less than fluid dynamics. Exactly. And it obeys the same expansion I showed you in the fluid dynamical complex. Okay? And uh, if you solve these equations and plug them in here, what you find in the gravity side is you find these black holes that, that are not sort of sitting there for all time. They're sort of slowly moving around. They are slowly expanding. They are creating um, gravitational waves, etc. Et so that's what I, 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 I sort of call inhomogeneous because they're not homogeneous in space. They're dynamical because they move, they're sort of moving in time. Then black hole solutions in this in this universe. And how do we know this? So how do we derive this? So I go back. And, and I study gravity in this in this universe, and I ask what happens if I perturb this black hole. So when I perturb any system, the easiest way to describe what the what the perturbations look like is to describe for you what the response function is. So I Fourier transform that response function and plotted its structure in complex plane. So the response function has a set of poles, which which you can think of as particle particle states. They are quite particle state, they are more like composite quasi particle states. In the co composite quasi particle states of this system, there is a set of poles that sort of go up here and uh, sort of pose in this, the two different channels, it doesn't matter what they are. But what's, what's very important is that in this, and there are infinitely many such poles, but of this infinitely many set of poles, there sort of two distinguished ones. There's one which sort of sits here at the origin, uh, uh, it has zero frequency at zero momentum, so it looks like a massless particle. This pole has a linear dispersion. Frequency goes like momentum. This pole has a quadratic momentum. Frequency goes like momentum squared. In this case, this is the real frequency. This is an imaginary frequency, this is IK squared. So if you really translate this into uh, standard language, this is like a sound mode, photon, uh, phonon mode that propagates li linearly. And this is like a diffusive mode that sort of diffuses uh, momentum diffusion mode in this case. And so our, our strategy 
was to mimic the picture of hydrodynamics very thoroughly in gravity. And so all we asked ourselves is, we have these light modes, we have these massless states of the theory. They are roughly like moduli. They are moduli in the sense that you can sort of move, move in those directions, and they are the modes that you should keep in the low energy effective field. What do you get if you sort of, if you sort of make a collective theory of these modes? And that, should be, that, that, that theory should be hydrodynamics. <coughs> and what, what we said was, since locally, uh, in, in, in the fluid, I have patches of local equilibrium, I should take a black hole of corresponding to that equilibrium, equilibrated values of temperature and so on, and patch together patches of black hole, <coughs> and, and make a new solution. Now this, you say, sounds fishy because gravity is a non-linear thing. How do you patch together solutions? The, the amazing fact is that if you sort of think about this problem in this momentum expansion, um, uh, is that the whole structure linearizes, and you can actually carry out this process explicitly. So that we gave a perturbative construction of how to build this these kind of black holes by patching together different black hole spacetimes, and the picture that emerges is something like this. What you get is you get some kind of fluid flow on the boundary of the spacetime. This is some configuration of some kind of plasma of some quantum field theory, and corresponding to that plasma, which is <coughs> indicated here there is a black hole solution whose horizon responds precisely in the fashion dictated by that fluid flow. Okay, so this, the solution sort of extends out from this patch in some form into the bulk and, and beyond. I've only drawn the space time of the horizon. In fact, I've only drawn sections on the horizon and on the boundary. But the structure of the horizon mimics the flow on the back boundary. So that was the first statement. But then you can do a lot more from here. And the thing you can do is you can actually extract what the structure of the energy momentum tensor is supposed to be. There's some rules of, of this correspondence that allow you to do that. And if I if I go through those, those rules, then I find <coughs> some class of transport coefficient that tells me how this fluid responds. So we already saw the shear viscosity. That was this value 1 over 4 pi in units of the edge bar and kV were 1. There's a bulk viscosity which I showed you. That bulk viscosity for this class of fluids is 0 by symmetry. If you, have, if, you have a, if you have a fluid which has a scaling symmetry, then you can't have bulk viscosity because the bulk viscosity corresponds to a mode of the fluid where the fluid sort of expands back and forth. And this is a, this mode is inconsistent with scaling symmetry. And, but then we couldn't stop. I mean, this is what usually you do. Since we can, we could do this process. We went one one higher order in the gradient expansion, and we computed second order transport coefficients in this process uh, for this kind of black hole fluid. We got some numbers, and the reason to show these numbers is not because they're, they're, they're anything interesting, but this is the only fluid for which second order transport coefficients have been ever derived from first principles. This calculation cannot be done in perturbation theory for reasons that I can explain, you will ask me later. It has not been done in perturbation theory, it cannot be done from the Boltzmann equation. And the, this black hole plasma is the only one for which we know nonlinear transport coefficients. <coughs> And because it's the only one we know, nonlinear transport coefficient is the one that's been used in numerical simulations for heavy ion collisions. And, and we weren't the only people to do this. We got four out of these because we didn't turn on curvature. Um, uh, uh, these folks got the remaining three. Uh, they got this one and two of, two of the others. We got. So now I can go back and uh, uh, tell you uh, the connections. So for the, so these are the, you, you can sort of uh, take these coefficients and say, look, I don't really know how to compute this for the quark gluon plasma, which is really QCD material, but the kind of field theories I'm talking about here are, you know, sort of like QCD. So can I, can I use this intuition to um, get some physical into some picture at least some some sort of values to set up my problem for the QCD plasma? And uh, indeed, as I say, uh, people um, found that very useful. And the whole story, uh, which started in this, with this work of uh, Kofsu et al, um, uh, was based on this observation that this value is what's consistent with numerical uh, hydrodynamic simulations for the quantum. I also talked about the cold atom system. Um, and here I should say that the cold atom systems are, I, I cheated, the cold atom systems are not these. 
they have really non zero relativistic fluids. They're, they're, um, because they have very low velocities, and uh, but they are under, but they are compressible, and uh, in fact because of the way you, you treat these systems, they also have non-relativistic scaling symmetry. Something, something. So, one one uh, uh, question I would have is that you know, it, 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 black holes are 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 objects that are described <coughs> by a very small number of parameters, right? <coughs> you know, just the mass and yep. charge and so on. These things, these these hydrodynamic equations are coming from the, you know, the perturbation theory of these black holes, and that somehow suggests that they should also be extremely universal. Yeah. So, and of course, this is only valid when you have some uh, conditions like large n and so on. But mm -hmm. it would suggest that, for example, supersymmetric and non-supersymmetric theories in the large n limit should have exactly the same hydrodynamics. Yes. Is, are there statements like that? Can you comment on that? Yes, I, I had a statement a couple of slides ago about universality. Yeah. So the, the, this correspondence does suggest that there's a wide class of quantum field theories for, whose energy momentum transport in the in the near equilibrium thermal regime is, if you can argue convincingly that is described by gravity in ADS, they will all have the same answers for their transport conditions mm -hmm. in that limit. Of course, if you do, if you if you ask if you deviate away from that large n kind of limit, you will see corrections, but that's expected. Because that, so as long as so the, the right statement to make is, it's not quite just the black hole. If you can convincingly argue that that your quantum field theory is well described in this limit by Einstein gravity, mm -hmm. then transport coefficient universe. Can you give an example of such a quantum field theory? Good. Um, so the simplest quantum field theory is a four-dimensional quantum field theory that has um, uh, QCD-like matter. It has gluons. It has um, some fermions. But it also has some scalars because the theory is supersymmetric. So this is what, what usually is called the N equals four super n miss theory. It has six scalars. It has some number of wild fermions. And, and uh, what, what Marcus meant when he said large n is that QCD has a gauge group SU3. So my, my theory has gauge group SUN, and n is very, very large. But it's, it's in that limit that this theory is. But they're closely related cousins. I can, I can actually break supersymmetry in the theory and, and get similar answers. Um, sorry, I, I was talking about this non-relativistic case. In the non-relativistic case, uh, we actually, uh, following some uh, uh, papers by uh, various people, uh, uh, we, we uh, together with with his collaborators, Son and Herzog, and, and so on, we, we managed to show that, again, the shear viscosity is universal. We also gave a hydrodynamic description of these systems. So it can be done. It requires a generalization of the ADS safety correspondence, but it's not complicated. All right, so how much time do I have, Marcus? Well, I'm almost there. Yeah. Can I have five? Or, yeah. or, 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 yeah. OK, so I, I actually want to, so, so this is sort of Status quo as a few years ago. Uh, I, I want to sort of take um, uh, take a moment to tell you a few things that we've been doing recently, which, which actually is inspired by this construction, but tell, tell you something very fundamental about what I think about uh, uh, hydrodynamics itself. And uh, so to set the stage, let me say that the entropy current, which was sort of funny object in hydrodynamics, I told you it was a funny object. Um, uh, in, in, in the black hole, in the gravitational context, it, it's much more natural. It, it's really some kind of structure on the horizon. The horizon, the presence of a horizon is what causes the en entropy. The, the, the area of the horizon is uh, related to the entropy current, as we showed a few years ago. Now, since this correspondence in the last eight years, people sort of started digging deeper, because now we had an explicit playground. We have this, you can do gravity computations. They are reasonably easy, and uh, uh, you, you, can, you, can, you can start building a repertoire of um, transport properties of various stuff, and then you can, you can examine how, what, 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 what happens. Um, <coughs> so we learned some useful things. We, we learned something that's reasonably obvious, but it was verified that the effective field theory of hydrodynamics is an asymptotic series, like any other effective field theory. Um, we learned that uh, they're not trivial equality type constraints. You don't just get inequality type constraints, which say this viscosities are non-negative. You also get some conditions which say that 
certain class of transport is forbidden because it's inconsistent with second law. And something which is quite remarkable and, and really fascinating is that if you have a theory with an underlying anomalous symmetry, that anomaly manifests itself and it manifests itself in a tangible fashion. So, so we, we started asking ourselves a few years ago, can we sort of put all these pieces of evidence together and build, the, build up uh, an autonomous theory of credit dynamics? Let me pass by this for the moment. And for that, I, I, I want to say that there, there, there are a lot of challenges if you actually want to do this. Part of the challenge is that, you know, when you do effective field theories, you don't think of current, you don't think of energy momentum, tensile, and charge current, you actually try to construct actions. And it's not an easy thing to do if you want an action for a dissipative system. Possible, but it's not easy. And then there's this business of how to implement this entropy current uh, uh, concept, and there's no, usually currents, at least we, we've learned classically, uh, thanks to Noether, that currents come with symmetry, are, are most currents that, that arise, which are conserved or have some properties, come from some symmetry things. Entropy doesn't come, doesn't come from any such thing. It's also tricky to come up with a theory whose equations of motion are energy momentum and charge conservation. Because usually, if you think about it, you have a theory, the Euler Lagrange equations of the theory imply that if the theory was diffeomorphic invariant, that the energy momentum density would be conserved. But the conservation doesn't imply the Euler Lagrange equations. Conservation is, 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 is a much weaker condition. So you want some, some such structure, and then complicating all of this is the fact that we are really trying to do Wilsonian sort of low energy physics, but you have to do this in a density matrix. Because we are not doing this in a pure state, we have to do it in a density matrix. So how do we do this? And uh, if these questions are sort of closely tied to problems that people get confused about in black holes. Um, and, and I think as a sort of challenge, it's very not, not just a challenge for, for thinking about a problem of hydrodynamics, but it could tell us something interesting about black holes, so, which is one of the reasons we got started. And uh, if I don't get to say everything, you can find everything you want to know about how we think about this problem now in a paper that I wrote two weeks ago with my student Felix Hull and Dr. Naidam from IIS. But let me tell you one of the solutions which, which is known um, about how, how to think about density matrix. So if you have a state, it evolves up, up in time. If you have a conjugate state, it evolves down in time. You have a density matrix, I need both a state, a bra, and a ket. So I need something that evolves both forwards and backwards in time. And this fact was well appreciated by Schwinger in the 60s and uh, led to the, form, uh, the, the Schwinger Kelvish construction of thermal states. So if I have a thermal density matrix, uh, which is just what we write in statistical mechanics, then a thermal density matrix can be thought of as a, a sort of density matrix obtained by tracing out some, some uh, heat bar, if you like what I call the right, the left state, and that left state, uh, and the state that I write down is some um, uh, entangled state between, sorry, this should have been minus, uh, uh, between two copies of uh, Hilbert space. So, oops. So what, what I really have is I have a picture where I have a set of one set of kets, another set of kets, and they're entangled, and I construct a state like this. And if I trace out this ket, then I get my density matrix. What gravity does for you is something remarkable. It builds a black hole. If you want to construct this equilibrium state. Okay, so if I go back to my picture where these states lived on the boundary of some space time, in gravity, what I actually have is, is a black hole that bridges these two sets of states. That's exactly how the black hole I, I, I used as my starting point for hydrodynamics looks like in this area space. So this is all well, this is all old hat. This is something very well understood by in equilibrium quantum field theory by people like Schwinger and Keldish, and in the uh, context of black holes by uh, Hartle and Hawking, and uh, was pointed out in various, con uh, and it sort of plays a role in this new slogan, uh, ER equals EPR. But what's unclear in this picture is how to couple these two systems, how to couple the left and right system, because you want to couple them to in incorporate dissipation. And so we sort of asked, asked some questions based on this 
um, in this picture um, from, from some kind of first principles by taking some cues from Cologne. So what we did was we, we, we did something initially very, very mundane. We said, let's just classify all solutions to the hydrodynamic transport that are compatible with the se second law. Let's do a classification problem. And uh, so this classification problem we, we, we were successful in doing. Uh, and we found something very surprising. We found that you might expect that beyond an ideal fluid, you get lots of dissipative terms. And that turns out to be not true. You get lots of terms that actually don't produce entropy. Okay? A vast majority of nonlinear transport in hydrodynamics is non-entropy producing. And so, since it's non-entropy producing, we can reconstruct an effective action for that because it's a non-dissipative part of hydrodynamics. So, so I'll just flash you this picture because we, we found eight classes of transport, so we like to call it the eightfold way. And um, yeah. the, the pun is twofold, you'll see. <laughs> um, Please not eightfold. Uh, what? Please, the pun isn't eightfold. The pun isn't eightfold. The pun is eightfold. Um, but okay, so so so, so and, and and we sort of saw evidence for this from from holography, but when we started constructing effective actions for this non for this adiabatic part of transport, we saw something really funny. We saw that you can't do this for a vast majority of these eightfold classes. In fact or anything other than two classes of this eightfold classification without doubling the number of degrees of freedom, without actually using the fact that you're in a density matrix. So we wrote down effective actions for this adiabatic transport involving <coughs> two sets of degrees of freedom, sources for both what I would call the left and the right CFT as in my picture, but you want to somehow know, something has to tell this theory that it came from some underlying unitary quantum field theory, and that turns out to also come out in this picture, but from some non-trivial emergent gauge symmetry. So the claim is that hydrodynamics has an abelian gauge symmetry, and this current associated with the gauge symmetry is related to the entropy curve. Okay. So, 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 so we have evidence for this, and this is our effective action. It won't make any sense, it didn't get explained. But the, let me give you a picture for what has actually happened. The picture we have is something like this. In a <coughs> gravitational context, hydrodynamics is described by some kind of black hole. The, the degrees of freedom here, which are hydrodynamical, but the heat bath is sort of living out here. It's, it's on the other side of the black hole. Somehow I need to translate the information of the heat bath through the horizon onto my physical side. But that requires some kind of gluing condition on this horizon for compatibility, some kind of detailed balance condition. And that detailed balance condition says that there is a symmetry, there's a photon uh, uh, which, which implements entropy conservation. And uh, in fact, we have some evidence following our paper that this actually works even to incorporate dissipation. Um, and there's an interesting slogan there, but um, let me sort of quickly wrap up. I'm using my time here by saying that. This interplay between gravity and hydrodynamics, you know, if you asked me a decade ago whether I would be doing hydrodynamics now, I would have said, well, not quite. But it's been quite enriching, and I, and I think it's been quite enriching simply because by, by sort of thinking about the problem of hydrodynamics from a completely orthogonal point of view of thinking of black holes and gravity, you gain some insight that, that you won't have otherwise obtained. And it's remarkable that with, all, with, with this, with this uh, Intuition, we've, we've actually managed to classify hydrodynamic transport a task. Again, when I started thinking about this problem, I would have thought quite hard. And uh, we, have, we have this new principle, which I'm happy to explain in private, what, what, what it means. But there are lots of questions. And uh, for me, one thing that I, I would really love to know is, does this extend beyond equilibrium? Can we actually do, learn something new in non-equilibrium physics? So next time you see your favorite fluid, Maybe you should be thinking, if not of a realistic black hole, at least a theorist concept of that. So with that, thanks. So let me just remind everybody that uh, we will have an informal discussion tomorrow at 1 p.m. down in the Lagrange Lounge again. So that will be a lot of time for, for detailed discussions.
Um, that's some questions for now. Just a quick question, I guess, we'll probably discuss details more tomorrow, but yeah. I'm curious, actually, this last paper you said about this emergency gauge synergy that comes out from the entropic description, of the, from the statistical core graining. Yes. Yes. For this, this is, you could, in principle, make that statement without ever talking about the bulk, right? This is all... So everything I said in the last two right. scan right. minutes of the talk, right. They're just two dynamical right. analysis. So here is actually the curiosity that I have. Yeah. There is this old Weinberg within no go theorem for the emergent gauge symmetries. Yes. That would at least naively seem to stand in the way of such a statement like this. No. What gives? The Weinberg Witten theorem yes. tells you that a spin two field. Which spin means, one as well. No, no, spin. Yes, spin one as well, actually. Uh, with Lorentz invariance. Yes, with yes. Lorentz invariance. So this is. So you're saying the point of is that you, you have a preferred in, reference thing set by the fluid. Okay. So in some sense, actually, you are really building. Yeah. In a certain sense, then it's really not that surprising that you see this gauge symmetry. It's no, merely no. the ordered parameter of yes. the theory, which arises from the fact that you have this yes. blob that's yes. built up. Okay, you know, you, 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 you said the word I wanted to write, but my, my collaborators would be unhappy with me writing them just here. That fluid dynamics. Is like a super fluid yes. for this for this broken Sorry, cement. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Let's thank Mokan again.